There's a big debate about who is God. In fact, if you ask 10 different people about God, you hear 10 different opinions. And it's not about whether you're right or I'm right or he's right or she's right. It doesn't matter who's right or wrong. I think what is most pressing in today's uh, society is have you experienced God? And what's it like to experience Him? That's why in this series, Check Him Out, we're looking at three things. I would call it nothing, something, everything. Did you hear me? Nothing, something, everything. So it, it, I could tell you something that at first it looks like nothing, but really it is something that has everything to do with your future, with your happiness, with your stability, with who you are, with how you perceive the world and make a difference. We're going to talk about God. Instead of talking in a debate format, you're right, I'm right, I want you to check them out for yourself. Experience God. Check Him out. Four years ago, Barbie Bassett was seven years old. And life was very dark at times with her family there in the Salem area. A lot of chaos happening. And it was at that time her mother started remembering the faith she'd grown up with. She said, I need to make some recommitments to God. And her mother made that decision and was rebaptized at the Gladstone Camp Meeting in Oregon four years ago. It was at that time that she was really beginning to pray for her daughter who wasn't sure there was a God because of all of the things she's surrounded with. God has answered those prayers of that mother. Barbie just started as a student a few weeks ago in a Christian school in this area with a dedicated godly teacher. She's a part of a church family that loves her and is nurturing her. And she has a mom who is looking after her and raising her to love Jesus. She's come to these meetings and responded to that God and said, I want to live the rest of my days for him. And Barbie, we are so thrilled for you. She loves animals. One of her favorite Bible heroes is Noah because he had all those animals in the ark. Who knows what God has ahead for your young life, but we know it's good, even though it'll be challenging, because you're going to serve Jesus for the rest of your days, and you have a home and family and church and school that are gonna help with that. And so, because of that, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith you can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way. He's prepared us a dwelling place there. It's going to be sweet mm, by and by. We're going to meet on a beautiful shore. Ah, oh, it's going to be sweet by and by. There are people who actually doubt such hope. Hope. It is a good thing. Somebody once uh, accused uh, uh, Barack Obama of speaking about false hopes. And he only asked, what can be false about hope? See, because hope goes beyond politics. Hope goes beyond religion. Hope is when you actually have a reason to live. Do you have a reason to live? See, folks who lose hope become negative. Well, I'm not sure about life anymore, and everything is bad, everything has problems. But when you have hope, it's a good thing. That's why we serve the Lord, because He gives us hope. The Apostle Paul referred to it as the blessed hope. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. That is a blessed hope. 
a sea of glass. That means there'll be no riptides or great white sharks waiting on you out just offshore. That's it. It'll be a perfect day at the sea. We're told that there will be a long table, miles in length, and you'll easily see to the other end of it, which means your, your eyes will be far better than mine. And there'll be the most delicious foods there, tacos and chiladas and tamales and burritos and other heavenly dishes. <laughs> and the fruit of the tree of life will be gigantic jalapeno peppers. I <laughs> see you. You eat the pepper, then you have to drink the water of life, and you live forever and ever. Amen. You don't like Rojasian theology? <laughs> it's all right. You can tell that I have the joy of the gospel in my life. I have hope. Hope is a good thing. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, thank you for hope. Give us another example of hope in Scripture right now. Speak to us. Sir, we would see Jesus yet again. In his name we ask. Amen. Our narrative tonight is drawn from the book of John chapter 4. John chapter 4. It turns out that Jesus was traveling with his disciples. They had to get to Galilee, but on their way to Galilee, they had to go through Samaria. On their way to Portland, they had to go through Eugene. You see, going through Samaria wasn't just your average trip, because Samaria was nothing like Jerusalem and nothing like Galilee. Samaria had a lot of outsiders, like U of O has how many thousands of outsiders who register every year? I understand Eugene can be one of the largest cities in Oregon during a game. <laughs> it's the same with uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, Omaha is the biggest city until the Cornhuskers play in Lincoln. Lincoln becomes the undisputed largest city in Nebraska during a game. And, and it's amazing in these uh, college communities what happens when the team wins. There is fuss on the street. There, there are people staying up all night screaming. And, 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 and it, the opposite is also true. I was in Nebraska one year when the Huskers lost. I didn't know they had lost. I went out to pizza with some friends. We went into the pizza place and it was quiet. Nobody had music, that loud music on the juke, jukebox that goes with every pizza place. People were quiet. They were speaking in low tones, even at the salad bar. And I was all happy. I said, what happened? Shh, don't say anything. What happened? The Huskers lost. Oh, you'd swear they'd all just come from a funeral. <laughs> Folks were crying over there in the corner. People were inconsolable. <laughs> the Huskers lost. I wonder if they played Oregon. I don't know. I, uh, I haven't been around here yet when, when Oregon loses. I, I hope it's not as bad. Outsiders had come into Samaria years before. And, and they didn't choose to come to Israel. They were put there by the army that had destroyed Israel. And, and, and he, they left him one Jewish priest from the tribe of Levi to lead them. And... and the people of Israel were in exile for 70 years. And, and meanwhile, back in Israel, in Samaria, these poor outsiders did the best they could having to live in Israel. And they became uh, of the Jewish faith. They served the God of Israel. And they were led faithfully by a priest of the tribe of Levi. Well, he sooner or later got old and passed away. Now there was no one Jewish left, much less somebody of the tribe of Levi. And so they chose one of their own to be a priest. So when Artaxerxes gave the order for Israel to go home to their country and rebuild the holy city of Jerusalem, the Samaritans came by. Hi, um, we've been living here a long time. 
it's good to see you guys coming home. And we serve the God of Israel. And who is your priest? And they produce some Greek guy, you know. He wasn't even a much Jewish, much less the tribe of Levi. And it was anathema to Israel. No, you shall not help us rebuild Jerusalem. And ever since then, there was this tension between the, the Jewish people and the Samaritans. Even though the Samaritans were innocent, war is war. Pain comes with these things. They had no choice in the matter. And I really relate with the Samaritans because I'm, I'm a mestizo. We are called the mixed race. We were happy natives living in our land when somebody came and planted a flag in our front yard and said, we discovered you. <laughs> We've been living here for 3,000 years. Yeah, we discovered you. There's no map in Europe that has your, your place on it, so we found you. And we, in, in my case, we were declared New Spain, and we couldn't even pronounce that. New Spain, and they gave us facial hair. See, the mestizos are the mixed race. That's called ethnic cleansing now. You know that. There's a saying in Spanish, la verdad no peca, pero incomoda. The truth does not sin, but it makes you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not blaming you. Do I look angry? No. Now you know, though. I'm a Samaritan. But at the same time, there is Jewish blood in my veins. The diaspora did occur. We did spread throughout the world. And my facial hair comes from Spain. But the rest of me comes from here. Aren't you excited? <laughs> okay. I know you're just being courteous. It's okay. It's okay. I just disagree with everything. It's okay. It's okay. I'm just trying to pay to paint you a picture of the Samaritans. There was this discomfort thing. They were the illegal aliens living in, in Israel. What are they doing here? They should go home where they came from. There were even laws that they were not to see each other unless there was commerce. To buy or sell something, yes, but friendship, intermarriage, any of those things were taboo in society. So Jesus had to go from Jerusalem to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. And it says here in the first part of chapter 4, in verse 3, that as he began to go up in verse 4, he had to go past a town called Sikar. Sikar. What distinguished this town is that it was built on a hill, a very high hill. And at the base of the hill was one of the sacred places of Israel, the 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 well of Jacob, Israel himself, dug this well and gave it to his son Joseph. You know why that means a lot to me? Because that's my name in English. <laughs> I see, I know you're excited again. Joseph, Jose. The, the well was given to him by Jacob, his father. Jesus was exhausted. He was tired. It was a hot day. It's a desert area. And they pull up to, pull up, they walk up to where the well is, as if they had a Chevy or something. <laughs> they walk up to where the well is, and Jesus says, okay, I'm staying right here. I'm thirsty. Why don't you guys go up into town and get something to eat? There must be something open, a Taco Bell, anything. Just go on up the hill and get something to eat in Sicar. I'm going to wait here. And it was like an oasis. So, you know, wherever there's water, plant life occurs. And Jesus was sitting there at this well. After a while, the men had disappeared up into Sicar, up on the hill, among the Samaritans. Hope none of them steal my stereo. Samaritans were never to be trusted. The Samaritans were a bad influence on our children. The Samaritans were not a place for us to be. If you were true to your faith and to your God, you'd have nothing to do with the Samaritan. So Jesus sat by the well, and after a while, he sees this girl coming down the hill, a Samaritan girl. She's got an empty pot. You see, women had to go down the hill twice a day. 
underscore women with all those muscles up there those men it's the women who had to get up before sunrise to come down to the well and drop their pot with a long rope into a deep well and flip it and then they had to do the guy thing these girls they must have been really buffed because this is a workout twice a day to pull that pot out of the well put it up and go back up the hill carrying this 50 pounds or more of water because the kids and the husband were going to be waking up soon <laughs> and and so then they there was water there for breakfast there was water there to wash hands there was water there to wipe down the faces of the kids water for the morning rituals and activities and, and in late afternoon the women had to go back down the hill to draw water again why because their husbands who tell their friends my wife doesn't work are going to come home from work and they're going to be hungry they want something to drink before they eat and so they go down for the second time here it is it's now the late afternoon it's about the sixth hour jesus is sitting there he's very hot very tired and this girl and sisters I don't know how you guys do it, but you can see everything. You must have eyes back here. Women can see everything. They walk into a room and they see each other. They immediately know what each other is wearing. Now, where did those shoes come from? Ha. I said, which ones? The one back here. Look at those shoes. Do you have eyes in the back of your head? She just walked in. Sisters can see anything and I think it's a gift from the Lord because you're supposed to be able to see your children at all moments isn't that true you could be having a conversation with a woman wait 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 what what Shh. I knew it it's the baby she heard the child and the dude I didn't hear anything <laughs> see women have these incredible gifts from the Lord you can't mess with your wife treat her with respect she has unusual gifts the girl can hear anything. Even if she, her head's covered over with a pillow, <laughs> I hear the baby. Sweetheart, our kids are 38 years old. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I just, you keep hearing the baby, don't you? <laughs> you still hear your baby. It's a gift. It's a gift from the Lord. Guys are like, well, I never quite learned it, but I'm glad she was there. And this woman is coming down to, the, to the, uh, the well and she sees him. She's not going to give away the fact that she knows he's there. But she's freaking out. He's Jewish. Oh, no. So she wants to speed up and suddenly Jesus breaks every tradition and value and he says to her, I'm thirsty. Give me to drink. This was scary. <laughs> what? And he just smiled. How is it that you, being a man, I'm a woman. See, another law was a guy and a girl could not be alone anywhere for obvious reasons. The traditions didn't trust humanity enough to allow a man and a woman to be all alone all by themselves in such a quiet and gorgeous place as by the well i'm a woman how is it that you talk to me i'm a woman and a samaritan and jesus said because i'm thirsty <laughs> you know water is water and she's well this is she's thinking this is highly irregular I read in the Sabbath school quarterly, this is not appropriate. <laughs> and Jesus didn't, you know, I, you know, I am thirsty. But, 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 and finally, she says, how are you going to, because Jesus says, I'm going to give you something. What, what? If you drink the water I give you, you'll never be thirsty again. And you could tell she's feeling uncomfortable. Well, how are you going to draw water to give it to me? 
you know, because he didn't have a pot. And Jesus says, no, 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 mija. The water I want to give you, you will never thirst again. And she's thinking, we're told here in the scriptures, I can get out of having to come to the well twice a day. He can come and get his own water if he's thirsty. And she says, God, I would love it. No, 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 no. This is deeper than that. If you drink the water I will give you, you will live forever. And she's stunned. Are you serious? And then as she's astounded at his at his teaching suddenly because Jesus was a rabbi like none other remember his yoke was easy what was the yoke of a rabbi their interpretation of the scriptures his yoke was easy his burden was light his message is easy to understand his theology can be comprehended by the greatest scholars and doctors of the law or the simplest peasant who's never been to school a day in their life anyone can understand Jesus I was in Peru and we were having baptisms out by the lake. I preached that day. I had an experience I will never forget. I stood at the lake shore looking at the mountain at 12,000 feet elevation. And every half hour, I had to take a hit of oxygen. Because you're at 12,000 feet. And the air is thinner. You get this nausea and profound headache. You get altitude sickness. You know, I'm not no mountain climber. And uh, one day I forgot my oxygen. I was sick for the rest of the day. It's miserable headache, miserable nausea. And it's just because you're too high. The air is too thin. And then when you preach like me, you lost the last breath of air you had. So I was getting my hit of oxygen and then I remember as I got up got out of the car there were 35,000 people on the mountain the cows were very upset because they were sitting on the lushest of the pastures the green grass and the cows were like move and they were sitting there for church and I was coming in to preach I saw the little platform and the little microphone system they had set up, and suddenly a woman comes running up to me and she says, will you dedicate my baby? And she has this crying infant. I said, yes, it'd be a great honor. Where's his father? Him, you. You, you could tell who wore the, the skirt at that house. And a very embarrassed young man took off his hat. Yes, stand right here so the pastor can pray for the baby. <laughs> He dutifully stood where he was commanded. And we had the most wonderful moment of prayer as I dedicated that child unto the Lord. Suddenly someone whistled. They're dedicating babies. Twelve more couples came scrambling down the mountain. We're dedicating babies and they're already introducing me. I want to preach. And we had these dedication services before we can get to the platform. Well, that day 9,000 people gave to their lives to the Lord in baptism. But I'll never forget a gentleman in his late 80s, having lived in the Altiplano of Peru all his life, was crying uncontrollably. And he was just crying and crying. And I said, why are you crying? And he just couldn't contain himself. He cried and cried. And so I just took time to comfort him and, and hold him close. And, and finally, he was able to begin to tell me. He says, I have failed before the Lord. I have failed before the Lord. How have you failed? I'll pray with you. I only brought 114 people for baptism. My goal was 500. I have failed. And he cried uncontrollably. I was confused. If somebody brought 114 people where I'm from, we'll put them on the front page of the Evidence Review and give them a trophy or something. I, I had to ask him, what did you do? I testified. I told people what I've seen Jesus do. What Bible do you use? Did you use some study guides of Scripture? And he says, I can't read. 
I've never been to school in my life. I can't read or write. But I tell people what God has taught me. And I share with them what I have seen him do with my own eyes. You see, Jesus' yoke is easy. His message is easy. His burden is light. Anyone can understand the love of God because Yeshua made it acceptable and understanding to anyone from any walk of life, of any age. You can be elderly. You can be a child. You can be a man or a woman. You can be of any culture. Any of us can understand Jesus. It's simple. So this girl says... What do you mean I'll never be thirsty again? Oh, well, let me explain it. Jesus tells this girl, this Samaritan girl back at, meanwhile, back at the well, why don't you go call your husband? Uh, I don't have a husband. I know, sweetheart. You've had five husbands. And the guy you're living with now He's not your husband either, is he? Put yourself in her place. Their society was far more brutal than ours is today. And no different than us in many ways. Our culture will forgive men of anything. But we don't forgive women. I don't know why that is. We forgive men. A guy can get up. I was a womanizer for 20 years, and the Lord saved me. Amen. People, amen. He was a womanizer. Now he belongs to Jesus. Amen. Imagine if a sister got up. I was a manizer <laughs> for 20 years. Would you forgive her as equally and as easily as you forgive a man who repents of his sins? You see, there's something about what women suffer that men just don't understand. This girl of Sikar was an outcast. She had had five men, all of whom had promised her, I love you, you know that, I don't have to be telling you every day. You know I love you, I don't have to say it. Oh, I hate it when guys say that. She already knows, Pastor, she knows I love her. I don't have to be saying it. Dude. She wants to hear it all day long with flowers, with loveys, with whispers, with, with a splash of water. She wants to hear that she's loved a million ways. Is that true, sister? Amen. And just because you're retiree, does that change anything? Do you still want to hear you're loved every day, all day long? Amen. Gentlemen, tell her. Check her out. <laughs> tell her you love her. I remember when I was going to school in college days, you know, all of your money is tied in tuition, and students know exactly what I'm saying. There isn't even Taco Bell because all of that went to tuition as well. You learn to share that one slice of bread throughout the week with a lot of faith. Ah, ah, that crumb was mine, remember? <laughs> and, you know, I didn't have money for flowers, so on my way to the dorm to pick up my girl for our date, to church. <laughs> well, will you go to Sabbath school with me? <laughs> anyway, others go on other kinds of dates. I dated my wife to church. Poor thing. Anyway, and I didn't have money to buy flowers, so the weeds would be blossoming in all their glory. And I would pick some stinky weeds, and all women do the same thing. When you give them a bouquet, they smell them. And they would smell horrid. They're beautiful, thank you. <laughs> See, she didn't care if they smelled bad. They looked pretty, but you know what? They came from me. <laughs> I didn't know that she was collecting them. After we got married, we were moving, and I had this really, really light box. What in the... What? Let me see. Did the guy thing, shredded the tape and opened it. What's this? It's a bunch of dry weeds. Don't touch that box. Those are the flowers you gave me. Babe, that's just a, we can go out and grab an armload of this stuff right now. I know. But this stuff, okay, this, this one right here, and it's just these ugly sticks and 
that the leaves are falling off of it. You gave this to me in front of the dorm when you asked me to be your girlfriend. You leave this weed alone. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna move this box myself. She has a box of weeds. But when a woman sins, she is summarily condemned by the entire community. Moms do not want their sons to be around them. Suddenly she's anathema. Suddenly it'd be better that she was dead than alive. This poor girl, five different men lied to her. Yes, I love you. Yes, I'll marry you. And those five men took advantage of her. She believed in her loneliness that she had finally found the man of her dreams and he would break her heart. And in her brokenness, another guy would make his move. She'd believe him too. You see, victims are easy to understand and identify. They're unable to stop abusers. And the sixth man she lived with was not her husband either. But Jesus is offering this girl the water of life. You drink what I want to give you, you live forever, mija. You live forever. And I, I know about those guys. And the one you're living with, he's not your husband either. And then she says, I perceive that you're a prophet. You know some stuff. But what's getting her is that he's offering her love, acceptance, personhood, and dignity. I perceive that you're a prophet. You know, in Jerusalem, they teach that Messiah is going to come. The Messiah will come and they will worship on the mountain. Here, we just teach that while we're worshiping on this mountain, Messiah is going to come. The Messiah is going to come and he's going to show us all things. And then Jesus did something he rarely did during his ministry. Because for everybody else, he'd say, see that you tell no one. Make sure you tell no one. But for this girl, when she says, we believe the Messiah is going to come to this mountain and he's going to tell us all things, Jesus says to her, I am he. I am he. <gasps> At that moment, the disciples arrive. Hey, Master, we have food. Oh, they interrupt the most precious moment. A master, it's a Samaritan girl. Hope you haven't been talking to her. They were afraid of her. And while they're pulling out the burritos, the soft tacos, and the other things they had brought, Jesus says, I'm not hungry. I have other food. And we're told here in the scriptures that the disciples said, maybe somebody else brought him something to eat. You see? You see? We had to go up there with the Samaritans. Those accursed people up on the hill. And Jesus already ate. Somebody already gave him a sandwich or something. Meanwhile, the girl's running desperately. She left her pot of water for everybody to drink. She's running up the hill. The disciples didn't even notice her. They have no context as to just what had happened. The Messiah had just revealed himself to a Samaritan. And she was scrambling up the hill. <laughs> she was in shape. She did that hill twice a day for who knows how many years. Now, if it had been a guy, <gasps> he'd have a side ache, he'd be limping his way. <gasps> no, but she was in shape, running with a full long dress up and down that hill who knows how many years, since childhood went to get water at that well. She gets up to town, everybody, I have found the Messiah. Uh, he's a man, right? 30-ish, good looking. Her reputation went before her. I know what you're thinking. He knew everything that I have done. And he offered me the water of life. What? Everybody, come here, come here, come here. It's, come here, please, everybody, and with the commotion. Once you see that there's a commotion, everybody seems to come. You notice that? Um, a, a guy in New York City was at work, and as he pulled his head back, he strained the muscle, and he couldn't pull his head down again. <laughs> and this muscle tensed up, <laughs> and he had to go to a clinic in, 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 
past the Bronx toward Manhattan. And he was like this. And, and the doctor said, oh, yeah, you have a muscle spasm. Take two of these pills for muscle relaxing. And, and he heard the, the golden words, you get two days off of work. And he calls his wife, yeah, come pick me up. And he steps out into the streets of New York City like this. Because he can't pull his head down. <laughs> Next time you go to New York, try it. He did this, and he's waiting for his wife. So other people saw him. <laughs> Pretty soon, thousands of people. Cabs are pulling over. <laughs> All you saw was this one pigeon going by. See, it's called the power of suggestion when you see something's going on. Well, what is it? Nothing, it's just blue sky. It's all. See, this poor guy has a muscle spasm. Now all of New York City is enjoying the blueness of the sky. <laughs> see, and so this girl is talking. Something's going on over there. There's this commotion. Before you know it, all of Sikar had approached her. She says, I have found him. What's his name? Yeshua. Shia, he's of Nazareth, he's the Messiah, he knew everything that I have done. E everything? Girl, that's embarrassing stuff. I know, I felt ashamed, but then he offered me the water of life. Oh. And so when I asked him outright, are you a prophet? No, I, I, then he identified him himself he's the messiah and then we are told that the entire town started coming downhill toward jesus when the disciples master that's that's a lot of samaritans let's go hurry hurry no no i came all illegal aliens i wonder if they even speak english People still ask me, do you speak English? I said, yes. Do you? <laughs> I was buying groceries over here in, uh, in the state of east of here. And uh, uh, the lady was really sweet. Thank you, sweetheart. That'll be $9.23. And I put down my 10. She gave my change. Thank you, honey. I said, no, quite to the contrary. Thank you, ma'am. Huh? Honey! She called her husband. Hurry! Hurry! Come over here. Come. Say something. <laughs> Me? Yeah, just anything. Well, what did you want me to say? He doesn't have an accent, sweetheart. Did you finish high school? <laughs> How do I tell her I'm working on a second doctor's degree? I mean, it's just, Samaritans, we have a way of scaring good people. Don't be afraid of us. We love America too. You see what I'm saying? Does this make sense to you? I know it feels weird to hear it, but don't worry, I'm not angry. I still love my country. And I still love you. <laughs> These guys, all the men and women of Sikar came down the hill. To the horror of the disciples, Jesus began to greet them, hug them, just fellowship with them, because they believed Hamashiach would one day come and show them all things. One day the Messiah would come. In Jerusalem, they were still waiting for a military general to come. And I've worked with a few. I've worked with military generals at different levels of our, of our leadership. I've worked with two joint chiefs of staff, chairmen of, of our nation. I, when I worked with General Colin Powell and we launched the Alliance for Youth, I have worked with generals. And you call these guys sir no matter what. Yes, sir. I mean, he's a... He's a civilian now. Yes, sir. Sir is the only title you can imagine for these guys because they emanate incredible power and authority. In the case of General Powell, great humility as well. But a Messiah is different. For he does not save you with weaponries. He saves you from your sins. 
You see, there are people who don't think they need a God until bombs are exploding all around them. Then they say, anybody here who believes in prayer, start praying because we're going to die here. You see, all of a sudden, when you have a need, that's when you recognize that there might be somebody who can intervene on your behalf. A power mightier than us who can love us so much that He can save us. In today's world, what is lacking most is a Savior, a Messiah. So Jesus was talking with them and they said, can you stay here? Master, no, 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 Master. Remember, we're doing Galilee by tonight. The meetings start tonight. Sure, we'd be happy to stay. Jesus stayed for two more days and seek God. And when Jesus preached, whoa, he could preach. One day I want to get some tips from him. <laughs> okay, how do you deliver on this point? <laughs> Once preaching is no longer necessary, I'm going to go talk to him about how to, can I preach better. My passion is preaching. I've been preaching since I was 16 years old. And uh, my hero is Jesus, the most powerful preacher that ever lived. Who else do you know of could preach for eight hours and nobody got sleepy? <laughs> nobody got hungry. It wasn't until the sermon was over. Uh, we haven't eaten all day. And a kid with a lunch pail gave up his tortillas and fish for everyone to have burritos that afternoon. Jesus stayed for two more days and he preached with power. He told them everything. See, he, he, the Messiah is going to come and tell us all things. He told them everything. From the holy prophet Isaiah's writings where, where, where he talks about the suffering servant that he would die for our sins. He would rise again and then he would come and claim us and take us home. At the end of the second day, the might of the statement that came, many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman who had testified he had told me everything I ever did. So many came because of her testimony, because she told them what she had seen him do. So when the Samaritans uh, were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there for two days. And many more believed because of his own word. So they first believed because of her, but after they heard him for themselves, they now believed of their own accord. Now remember what belief is. Belief isn't, well, I believe in the Ten Commandments and you're a terrible sinner. See, believe isn't that you know it. Believe isn't even that you accept it. You can believe and accept something without doing it. You may believe that it's 55 miles per hour over here on the 105. I mean, you may know and, and, and accept that it's 55 miles an hour because the sign says speed limit, 55. You may accept it. But if you don't believe it and drive 75, a highway patrol will explain it to you and then ask you to sign right there. If you have more trouble, he'll just tell you, explain it to the judge. So you can accept something as true. You can accept something as real. But believing it means you do it. You even feel guilty. I'm driving 55. I can't believe it. Everybody's passing you up. They even give you dirty looks. But you believe in the 55 zone because you heard in the news that a kid was hit by a car there the other day. So you're going to slow it down. You don't care who's mad. You're going to save a life today, right? See, once you believe in something, you do it. Well, that's what happened in Sikar. At first they came because this woman told them he, is, he told me everything I ever did. He has to be the Messiah. But now that they've heard him for two days for, by them, on their own, now they believe this is the Christ, the Son of the living God. When you experience him for yourself, you have something to believe in, not just something that you know and accept is true. The people who accept that there's ten commandments, and remember, the first four are our definition of what? A relationship with God. And the last six commandments are a definition of what? A relationship with people made in the image of God. There are people who keep all four of the first commandments, but they like to mess up on the last one because they beat people up and destroy faith and courage and comfort. They hurt others forever and ever. 
Amen. Then there are others who only like to live these over here, only live for people, but they don't care about disobeying God blatantly and confronting God and defying the Lord. See, they're just definitions of what it looks like when you have a relationship with Him and with people. The Ten Commandments are a joyous definition. And God says, so that you may know that I am your God. You may know that you are my people. Those Ten Commandments aren't a bunch of rules. They're descriptions. A physician may say they're symptomatic of a relationship. Does this make sense? That girl told others what she had seen. And the town marveled. Because she was the girl that was most criticized and condemned in the community. There are people who feel outcast. I have members of my family who are homeless. One day, I was speaking in Texas, and I cried out. I said, you know, my cousin Enrique, he was a champion boxer middleweight in Juarez, Chihuahua, Mexico. He moved to L.A. in the 60s, and I used to watch him box every Sunday night at the Olympic Auditorium. And I just turned on the TV, and there was my cousin boxing until one day he, he, he was Enrique Flores. He went in against a guy named Cookie Rojas. No relation. This Rojas was a machine. He was a robot with little sheets of rubber over him. He almost killed my cousin in the ring. That was back before all the regulations to preserve life in the ring. Folks used to die back then. Broke his jaw, broke his eye sockets, broke, 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 crushed, um, and ended his career on the spot. My cousin's wife told him, well, I didn't marry a loser. And she leaves him. He gets depressed. The income's not coming in from the fights anymore. And he has trouble keeping his job because he started drinking and, and he'd miss work and he'd get fired. And finally somebody, a friend on the street, offered him a hit of heroin. So then he became a junkie and he stuck on the streets of L.A. And so please, please do not refer to people on the streets as scum in our society. You will be insulting my family. Do not speak of my family in such derogatory terms. They are children of God also. If someone doesn't have a home to live and they're living at the train depot up here or under that bridge over there or hitchhiking along the five, do not pass judgment on that which you do not understand. You have no idea how many families are praying for those loved ones. And I broke down at the pulpit. I said, somebody, find Enrique for me. We found him when one of my uncles passed away. The next morning, everybody's wallet was empty. He stole from all of us. Why? Because he needed more heroin. He, he had to get a fix, and he had a spot where he could get some stuff. Stole watches, stereos, money. We all woke up uh, with empty pockets. And the $38 in the ATM was all there was anyway. And so I remember just how upset everybody was at Enrique. Well, time passed, and I cried out that day, please, please, someone. I live in Washington, D.C. Every time I go to L.A., I look for him, but I can't find him. And I just left it at that. Fast forward the tape. Play. All of a sudden, I'm back in Texas preaching. In, 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 it was in um, Lubbock, Texas, for a youth congress. And, and there was a couple... An elderly couple who came to me after the program, can we eat with you at the potluck? I said, sure. Burritos taste the same whether I'm alone or with good friends. Join me. As we're eating, I noticed they weren't eating yet. They were just so excited they had something to tell me. They said, we found Enrique. You found Enrique? Yes. We prepared the house first for the day we would find him. We got a guest room. <laughs> we put no valuables in it and except soap and shampoo and other things that he could take all he wants. And then we went out and spent two weeks until we found him. We brought him home and gave him the meal of his life. And sure enough, he wanted to take stuff, but he was in a place where there was nothing to take. And we put bars on our windows so he couldn't climb in. 
and he stayed in his guest room. And then we befriended. Then he be, we became family. And then he, de- he accepted to go to detox. And, and, he, and, he, and he, it was horrible getting through the withdrawals. And, and finally he got back on his feet. And we found him a job. And he's taking Bible studies. He's driving a truck in Minnesota. What? He's up there in the, the, the frozen tundra of... Yes, he's driving a truck up there. It's a lot harder to get stone there for him because he's used to palm trees in L.A. And it's another culture, and he'll have trouble figuring it out up there. But he's clean, and he loves Jesus. And here's his cell phone number. (laughs) Sí, bueno, Enrique, hombre, ¿cómo estás loco? Que no, no, José, ¿qué pasó? Anda acá manejando troque. He was great. Did you understand that? (laughs) There are many other Enriques out there. I have found the Messiah. He knew everything I've ever done, and he still offered me the water of life. Go and do thou likewise. Take the water of life and drink and then give it to someone else. The power of this woman's testimony is that whoever, whoever came into contact with her, she was going to tell them, I have met the Messiah. It was an experience. It wasn't a theoretical or theological summit that happened in Sikar. They literally met the Messiah. How do you know when you've met a Savior? He forgives you of your sins even though He knows everything you've ever done. He accepts you with open arms and invites you to live victory in your life even though He knows everything you've ever done. And then He gives you the power of the Holy Spirit that you can tell someone else, I have found Him. I have found Him. That's why we exclaim Baruch Hashem Yes, Mashiach. Blessed be the name of Jesus, the Messiah. If you've met him, you know what I'm talking about. Have you met him? Or do you just know a lot about him? Can you defend him theologically? Or can you defend him personally? I know I'm crazy, but I'm crazy about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ when they arrived among the Greeks in Macedonia and up in Rome far away from Jerusalem suddenly the gospel reached across the abyss to the Gentiles so as I play this song as I play this song I invite you would you like to drink that water of life if you want that water of life some of you Know that the water of life begins for you at baptism. If you would like to prepare for baptism, as you hear this song, come forward that I may pray with you at the end of this program. Others of you knew him once, and for whatever reason, you walked away. Tonight, he says, come and drink of the water of life. If you drink of this water, you can live forever. Come back to God. You may have grown up in the Baptist tradition, the Methodist tradition. You may have grown up in one of many Christian traditions. God is calling you. Come, give your life to the Lord. You may have grown up in the Catholic tradition. If the Lord is calling you to prepare, take this water in your life, come forward as I'm playing this song. Then I have other brothers and sisters here tonight who have never claimed any faith tradition. God has never been an issue in your life. But for some reason, you sense an experience with God this evening. The Lord is calling you as well. As I'm playing, if you want the water of life in your heart, come forward. Thank you. 